Please don't adjust your dial. You are now tuned in to the coolest class on YouTube. Um, I should keep going. CHSF 2107, Chapter 10. Hope you're doing well and uh, that your week's going well and stuff and you're uh, sticking to it, battling through if you're struggling at all and if you're not and enjoying things, that's awesome too and you know, grab a coffee, let's get into it. We're going to talk about early adulthood today, talk about topics like personality and relationship and some of these like uh, social emotional, right? Like in psychology, they love to combine those two words, but where does our, what is this interaction between our, our social world and our emotional world? And so much of our emotions are shaped by and live in our relationships. Let's get into it. Nice to see you or, you know, spend time with you. Cheers. Okay. First point of the day. And this is where I have to be humble. It's like teaching a course like this and it's all of a sudden I'm like, um, saying, okay, well, all your job is as an adult is to develop just you have to adaptively integrate your emotional experiences into enjoyable relationships just do that just do that and you'll be happy it's like oh my goodness could there be a more like loaded sentence it's like okay in a way that's adaptive meaning in a way that's like putting yourself in a position to take your step forward and become more functionally adjusted to your world in that way you need to be integrating your emotions in a way that help you actually enjoy the relationships that you're having with people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like, okay, well, you want to like say what's the biggest variable affecting things like your mental health, even things like your nutritional intake. It's like the person that you either marry or are with or, or just are around you. It's like, it's not just marriage, but it's like the more intimate the relationship, the bigger the effect. So the closest relationships have the closest effect. And the idea is that the idea here with this stability or change title is that there does seem to be an interesting connection all the way back to attachment. Though some of the earliest ideas that we had in this course, right? And that, um, so it says here for the first 20 years of life, lay the, the first 20 years of life lay the foundation for the development that comes later right that like and that sort of makes sense like obviously like how your adulthood goes is shaped by how you developed as a child it's like some of that is super obvious but some of it's also interesting because it's it's kind of like this idea that patterns get entrenched and and get repeated in different situations And so, I'm just trying to not like over, like jump over the significance of the point, right? That, that, that like how that initial relationship, because attachment style, like that's going right back to the earliest relationship, how that early establishment or lack of establishment of trust actually plays out and then affects long-term relationships as an adult like your adult attachment style is it more secure and do you have like a more positive view of relationships and if things go wrong or if you get cheated on or whatever you can see it as well that person made a bad mistake it's like and you can maintain your value obviously it's hard like i'm not trying to say that you're like emotionless but like are you able to like get close to others know that sometimes you get hurt but know that sometimes people are good people and are you able to have trust when it's appropriate i guess would be the word when people are trustworthy and then or do you have more of like an avoidant attachment right more hesitant and you could see how if you were more if the relationships that were in the environment you grew up in were less secure and the way that they were less secure is in being less reliable then you could see if your experience was a lack of reliability having a difficulty trusting committing 
feeling settled. And, and, you know, like then there's an anxious. So like the reason anxious and avoidance sound similar is because they're just two different examples of insecure and just in slightly different ways, right? Like, is it, is it more that because of the lack of trust, it's an angst around the relationship or is there an avoidance? In a retrospective study, Cindy Hazan and Phil Shaver in 1987 revealed that young adults who were securely attached in their romantic relationships were more likely to describe their early relationships with their parents as securely attached. In a longitudinal study, so just one done where you ask people something early and then the same people later, infants who were securely attached at one were securely attached 20 years later in life in their romantic relationships. Another longitudinal study revealed that securely attached infants in more stable romantic relationships in adulthood than insecure uh, attached counterparts. So basically just that securely attached infants were more likely to be in stable relationships as an adult. Yet another longitude study found that insecure avoidant attachment at eight years of age was linked to a lower level of social initiative and prosocial behavior. So less prosocial behavior and less social initiative and more social anxiety and more loneliness at 21. So it's making this point that like the insecure attachment manifestation that you see at an eight that is also linked to the very first stage right that like you can basically look at it at eight and look at it at 21 and see a consistency sorry that my wife's calling i'm gonna pause this okay i hope this works super risky move pausing a recording six minutes into the slide um and while i had this the PowerPoint now, you can have your note and you can have it scrolling as it, I just did this when I started talking about the studies. Yeah, here, I'm, I'm not going to risk it again, though. Okay, so, I already said, oh, wait. Yeah, securely attached adults tend to have a more positive view of relationships, find it easier to get close to others, are not as concerned or stressed out with their relationships. They tend to enjoy sexuality in the context of a committed relationship and are less likely to have one night stands statistically avoidant attachment styles individuals again these are broad stroke generalizations which by this point you've heard me say so many times avoidant individuals are hesitant about getting involved uh, once in a relationship they tend to do things to distance themselves from a partner and then with anxious attachment styles these are characterized so again when i'm like i'm not really saying these people are like this i'm saying if you were to group people based on these care based on attachment style and you're saying okay well how is this style different than this style and this is what the answer would be well the answer is with anxious attachment style those individuals tend to demand a lot of closeness but aren't very trusting and then that tends to be associated with emotions like jealousy and possessiveness welcome to Slide three. Um, Not always the. Oops, my note is scrolling. Cool feature, by the way, in the new PowerPoint uh, update. I don't know what happened. You know how, if you remember from the classes before the break, I was like almost going through an identity crisis with with PowerPoint Recorder not working anymore. I was like, this is my primary tool. I've, I've grown quite used to it. Um, the last couple presentations in the fall were like Zoom recordings, which I guess can substitute in a pinch, but, um, yeah, nice thing, because I can, like, I don't know if I can, I can even, like, switch through views within the recording, go to the slide view, just see this bigger, right, so I'll just describe this picture, then I have a bit of a note to read, um, You've heard of Big Five. But what does it... What does it mean to say that different people have different styles? That there's different person styles, there's different personalities. There's actually like five big areas that people are different. Because remember, we're not saying like genetically different or we're not, not saying that genetics doesn't influence personality, but... If you say that this, I don't really like this person's personality, it's like, well, what do you mean by that? And at a certain way earlier in this course, I had said that personality is like heavily related to your 
patterns of emotion, your patterns of behavior, the things that you like kind of do. It's not like you're a completely random person in every situation you go to, right? It's like there's a consistency amongst you. There's a style to your pattern. There's a style to your pattern of being a person, your personality, you know, weird way to say it. Mic drop, coffee sip, even though that wasn't the greatest point. Okay, but so now let's go across this, right? Because this is an acronym and sometimes you see it presented as ocean or canoe just because it's an easy way to remember the five. And then if you just remember the acronym, then again, I always, I always push, uh, I can say I always push understanding over memorization, but that's not necessarily true because like, at a certain point, the highest level is understanding with memorization. Like if you can just basically remember the acronym, right? And remember what the words stand for, but then understand the words, right? Be and it is the words because what they did is they went through the dictionary and tried to find all emotion-based words from this kind of presupposition or this starting point of like thinking that Language is our way of trying to communicate. So naturally, through the evolution of language, people's different styles of being has almost like been encoded in the language. So what they, and this is a weird way of presenting what factor analysis is, but it's like eventually when you're factor and analyzing, when you're analyzing the different words and you're saying, okay, well actually like love, joy, um, intimacy, um, yearning, all these emotions might be similar. And then you might start to find, okay, well, like they're so similar that actually if we ask a question and get your score on one of them, it actually really predicts your score on the other one. So actually we can just ask the one question instead of five. And you start reducing that so much till you get down to this like core, these like five main things that if you understand the differences between people on these scores, you'll understand how they are likely to act and respond to different things, different stresses, different situations. I did this test myself and I scored. Oh, it was so weird because I just did it, right? And uh, I'll talk about it on the next slide, but it's weird when you're doing it, knowing how they're what they're doing. Because I could like tell when I was answering a question that was going to score me higher in neuroticism or so it, but I tried to answer it as, as truthfully as I could. And anyways, I'll, I'll talk about it in a sec, but let's just go over the five, right? So openness. And in some ways, this is a easy to understand, but it's also an easy to oversimplify one. And it is like how much you're open to new ideas or whatever right or to new experiences or to like you want to travel to new places and you want to always and everybody sort of does but it's like people are different in that way it's like i'm sort of different like that like i'd go to a nice nice cottage on lake here on every single vacation basically my wife would more like to try different things i'm similar with restaurants like i'm fine with a with a nice chicken parm at east side mario's like every single time i go out uh, my wife would prefer more variety Right? You could look at that as a difference in openness to experience this this one main uh, factor, this one main variable, this one main attribute. Right? And that, like even how my wife will say, like I get like locked in my old man ways, like around that chicken parm or around like wanting to do certain things. It's like There's a familiarity, right? So it's not necessarily negative. This is where it's like different than some other things. It's, this isn't like an IQ measure, right? There's not necessarily like a good or bad big five score. Um, although that's not 100% true. Depends on what we're talking about. Like, I'm trying not to just jump into talking about my score. It's hard because I just did it and I'm, I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, conscientiousness, because basically what I was going to say is I scored higher than I thought I would on neuroticism, right? And uh, and then I started like looking into it and I was, had the thought of, I wonder if people in general just score higher in neuroticism now or in basically like 
negative emotion, right? Like just worrying about stuff or like feeling upset. And it's like, am I actually like more neurotic than I used to be? Or is it that like COVID in these last few years have just sort of cooked people's brains a little bit. And it's like, we need to heal a little bit from it and like calm back down. And maybe now is that like, I started to think this idea of like, how would something like COVID affect something like a psychometric evaluation of someone? And is comparing people's scores pre and post something like COVID even relevant? So I think the creators of this, like McCray, it'd be interesting to hear their, his response. Like, like, I think the idea would be, I would almost argue that an event that big probably really shifts how much you can compare before and after. But if you were to still give the test to a room now, it's a still an accurate way of showing differences within the current group, but I don't know. Like that's just speculative. It'd be interesting to, for, if one of you are looking for a research idea, how for something or like a research thesis or something like, because specifically the some of the stuff I was looking at was talking about how, and these were what I like scored higher in is like neurotic, the combination of neuroticism, introversion and conscientiousness where, so all of a sudden it's like, okay, you kind of get upset a little bit easier and you're also like r upset by things not making sense. And that, that was... So the study was looking at how people that score high in neuroticism and conscientiousness experienced more feelings of isolation and loneliness during COVID. And I was like, that is finally a very interesting study, you know, that's actually like a little bit uh, good on those researchers. That's, that's a, in some ways, an obvious connection to make. But it was the first time I saw that point being made. Obviously, it affects. Obviously, group level, huge effects, world things affect individual psychological states and psychometric tools are designed to measure psychological state. So anyways, then conscientiousness, yeah, like how much you care if things make sense and if things are organized and if things are disciplined and then extroversion and introversion um, is this kind of dimension of how you recharge. And, and even though I have a job that's like a lot of public speaking and a lot of doing stuff like this, it's like not a lot of doing stuff like this specifically, but a lot of talking, I guess. But then when you get into the literature, one of the ideas is that with introversion, it's more how you recharge, right? That like a big part of it is how much, if I'm like stressed out and I've had a rough week, what do I want to do? Do I want to like go and hang out with buddies or would I, and I, and I might still like that, but, or would I prefer to like, maybe, you know, watch a Raptors game with a bag of Doritos and just relax, right? It's like, or maybe read a book or maybe, you know, have a hot bath or do something a little bit more like self recharge retreat to my den. And then, and again, remember, this isn't like you're one or the other. It's like, what's more your tendency? We're talking about behavioral and emotional patterns, really, right? How much is agreeable? Oh, this is the other one. Like people that score like agreeableness, right? Or like more so the reverse people that score is less agreeable also in that last mix I was talking about. So imagine that you score in more likely to, to be upset by things is like a very general way to explain uh, emotional stability, but if you bear with me, and then like more concerned about order and then also less agreeable to go along just to go along. That people that scored in that area and negative mental outcomes associated with everything that's recently happened are what I'm saying, a fascinating line of research. Okay, I think I hit them all, right? It's actually, it, it was, it's actually got me like a little bit shell-shocked, right? Because it's like, when you do something like a psychology 
or even a psychometric, right? Just think psychometric, just anything that measures a, psych a psychology related variable, right? A psychology me me uh, measurement, a psychometric. Um, it's like you want it to say, oh, one of the best people we've ever seen. It's like, no, no, it says like, oh, guess what, buddy? You struggled just like everybody else. Your, your score comes back as painfully human. And it's like, that's kind of how it is. It's like all these subdivisions, it's all just different styles of us. But understanding your score and understanding your subscore also makes you like, like even me being all like, you know, whatever I just said, trying to like process my own score. And I knew it, right? I was like, while I was doing the test, I was, I could tell, I was like, I'm, I'm working my way towards like a high inverse score on emotional stability. It's like a bad score. And so inverse means when it's a high score, but then when in the scenario, when a high score is actually a bad thing, but like, I tried to still be honest. And like, sometimes I do feel like flustered when things seem like an un because what it is is it's basically just a series of questions and it's one to five now this isn't i didn't do like the actual i just i was actually just at the kids dance and i was like killing time and i'm like getting ready to usually when i'm going to talk about something like i haven't even um i was going to say i didn't even read the note from the last slide but you can you could add that to your notes it's just a breakdown that I probably freestyled pretty close to. Um, it's just like a little piece about each of the five things. If you wanted to just pause and go back a slide and just copy that down, you can. Um, but like in the note underneath the visible part of the slide in the PowerPoint file. Yeah, how question so how this works, right? I was gonna show you how you would do this, right? That like, okay, you wanna create a survey and how are there so many different personality surveys? And this one I did was just like a random website one. Yeah, I was about to say that because it was at the kids dance. And so I do it and it like gives me my quick results. And then it's like, you know, for 49.95, you can get this like deep insights into who you are. And it's like, okay, I can, I got what I need sort of. And, and it was, it was interesting, right? Like. especially if you're able to look at yourself from the perspective of, of course, you're not perfect because no one is. And actually, if, if you're even at a state of looking at yourself and looking where you can tweak things and get stronger, you're so ahead of the curve percentage wise. There's no reason to be upset. Again, I would love to talk to an absolute expert on psychometrics on how how psychometric scores, whether they're still considered as valid nowadays. Right, because if you hear these stats, like all these mental health indicators are through the roof, then the baseline of people's mental health has changed. So then if you're taking personality, so like you'd expect this, like you would expect in general an increase in, in some of these things, right? So again, I hope you found these rants at least somewhat interesting. So what you would do if you're creating it is you'd say, okay, well, agreeableness, you can break that down into like here, six subcomponents, like how much do you trust things? How straightforward are you? How much altruism do you show? How much compliance? How much modesty? How much uh, tender mindfulness? It's a little bit small, right? And then what you would do is you would just make a question related to that and have them answer like on a score to one to 10, how much does like developing long-term relationships based on people that you blah, blah, blah. That's some kind of question about trust. How much do you agree with this statement? And it's all like, how much you agree with it, right? Like a Likert scale, just a basic five scale. One's like uh, totally disagree, somewhat disagree in the middle, you know, really agree or agree, really agree, right? And then basically all you do, what I'm saying, trying to say it, taking forever to do is basically for each of the five dimensions, you have like sub six sub dimensions. And then you basically have a question or two for each of these. And that's your survey. 
and then what you do is the, it's like a calculation, right? And some of it's like displayed here. Right, it's like basically just asking you questions. And actually you can make a lot of, there's a lot of different personality variables, like even things like at your work, you might've done like colors or you might've done Myers-Briggs. And a lot of these are, are variations on this idea of actually, if you have a set of reliable questions that accurately cover these five areas and you give people at least a few questions on each, and if you have some counter questions, right? So when you're actually making a survey and you say like, do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like this? You wanna have a question there says like, do you not like this? And you want them to score that negative. And that's basically to just provide internal consistency to your, to your questionnaire or whatever, show that people are actually answering and paying attention. That's a whole other thing, right? Like how to, because nowadays everybody's interested in qualitative research and I can understand it's interesting. Quantitative research is pretty interesting too, like how to actually design a, a survey or like a measurement tool, which is what a good survey is, that actually is actually measuring something real, right? And this is one of the better ones. This is probably second only to IQ in terms of like long-term validity and uh, See the word validity and reliability, I guess. All right. Daughter, my daughter's got to go to uh, tap now, tap dance today. So uh, I'll record the rest of this tonight. See you soon. Next, uh, next topic. Welcome back. Okay, I got the. Whoa. Cat just jumped off the window ledge. Sure, the computer. Stay over there. Cat, it's on the camera. You see that? Well, don't actually go on the computer though. Okay. He sleeps like right beside here. I guess I can show you. I can keep turning it. Yeah, you can see that there's like a, like a cat bed. It's funny when I first got the cat. I'm like. Cat's not coming in the office now. It, like, it's basically sleeping on the computer. Okay. Yeah, I just kind of messed up my point. But like, I sometimes say to students, like, what's the one quote you always hear about marriage, right? And people will be like, well, all half of marriages end in divorce and the stats are something. Stay over there. Hey, hey, hey. Chill. You got a lot of energy. That the stats are like I just don't want to step on the keyboard and like and recording or something right like anyways most marriages uh, usually just it's all wild for half for a minute or two and then it'll chill um thing is is yeah like lots of marriages don't work but there's an interesting relationship between this this idea of like hey Oh man, I have to maybe restart this slide, buddy. Here, you gotta stay over here, okay? Come on. Um, he just keeps trying to like talk behind. Anyways, I stop talking about the cat. Chill, chill, chill. Most um marriages that last eight years last, right? That it's so. What that's trying to say, or what that insight is, is that yeah, like. Well, I guess I could say it another way. A lot of marriages that don't work out don't work out early. And that once marriages reach eight years, the percentage of them that end still happens a lot. But the percentage is less than, you know, it gets near to zero. And so what's this? If there is a piece of advice or a piece of like wisdom to be gleaned from this, it would be the idea that like, Okay, if you can make it to the difficult beginning, right, where you're learning about each other. I'm 10 years in now, so I'm an expert. I'm two years past, but it's like 10 years painfully working towards 11, just joking. But like one of the reasons people joke about it is because it's like sometimes you have to joke about things to take a little bit of the, the heat off, right? It's like anybody that's been married for 10 years, like unless you're ignoring the other person, there's things that there's places where there's friction and, and that you work on and you get better at. And it's like, 
I just think this is an important second part of that point that no one ever makes, right? Like if people want to be like, oh, half of marriages end in divorce. It's like the flip of it. I saw a comedian just the other day actually say like, start his joke with the opposite. He's like, I heard a scary stat about marriages that half of marriages work out and everybody laughed because he said like basically just the opposite of what they were expecting, which is often a, a way of humor, right? Pull the rug, like say the opposite. But um, it kind of reflects this societal idea, right? It's like everybody knows that. Everybody's heard that stat for some reason, right? And it's like, again, obviously statistics aren't that easy. It's not like it's exactly 50% everywhere in every scenario. It's just, I think the more general point is, yeah, like there's lots of marriages that don't work. And is there things we can learn from ones that do? Looking at this as psychologists, looking at this as people that recognize we're not the first group of human beings. People have come before us and there's lots of examples of successful and unsuccessful relationships. And after eight years of marriage, the probability of divorce drops to nearly zero statistically, right? So like even if only a half of a percent of the population like it's still a lot of people, especially in a country like the States, right? Like in the States is like 400 million people, right? So even 1%, right? So like now the bottom point there, I was going to say like even 1% is a ton of people. So like even and then yeah that second point sorry i'm just i'm gonna resist going on another huge rant here because i'm five minutes in on this slide sorry uh yeah merry adults are report being happier healthier and living longer with lower rates of psychiatric disturbance and it's like okay so sometimes students will ask questions of like how much what is the role of marriage Right, like, is it the same if you're just like in a close relationship? And I would say like, it depends. And it, one of the biggest variables that depends is this commitment, right? And it's like, how would you say marriage is different than other relationships? And, you know, there's a, to people like myself who are married in a church, there's the idea that it's actually more than a commitment. It's actually an oath. And that an oath is like a more intense word than commitment. Actually, the idea in, is that it's a three-sided agreement between you, the person, and your creator, if you believe that, right? Now, obviously, like, not everyone believes that. And obviously, nowadays, there's an aspect, like, people can get married by the local government. And you're like, okay, well, in that kind of scenario, say it's not a religious scenario, how is being married different? And I would say, well, it's psychologically different your relationship to someone is psychologically different if you're envisioning it as the long term if there's that commitment variable right and so if you're engaged with someone if you're not engaged because i know that in this context that's a very specific word if you're with someone in a really long term highly meaningful emotionally deep relationship you're both committed I think there's a reasonableness to say that a lot of the benefits associated with marriage would be similar, right? Like it's, it's the depth and quality of the relationship and how you're making sense of it, whether in a religious context or not, that speaks a lot to, to this idea of why it's related. It's like life's hard and it's less hard if you have someone kind of fighting with you through the hard days. Not that that's the only thing that marriage is, is fighting through the hard days, but it's like, it's all of it. Okay, let's keep going. So Gottman comes out with his, I'm just going to make sure I got, yeah, five. Okay, now I'm going to switch to teleprompter view, right? He has this idea of, of okay. Let's look at this topic as 
people interested in developmental psychology and interested in looking at large groups of humans and how they behave and patterns that we see. And let's not say like what we would think we would want relationships to be. Let's actually say like, okay, if we were to study successful couples of all different types, what would we see as commonalities? And so I want to just kind of read you this list, right? And, and present you this, this idea that Gottman had, right? And he had this, this first idea of, of what he called love maps. And I know it sounds a little bit like a Hallmark card, but like, let me read this to you. He said that individuals in a successful marriage have personal insights and detailed maps of each other's life and world. They're not psychological strangers and a good marriage partners are willing to share their feelings with each other. And they use these love maps to express their understanding and fondness of each other. It's like you have a shared story with the person. You're, you had, you've been on vacations with each other. You've been through things together. You've, you know what it's, a, you're not psychological strangers. That's a good way of saying it. You're familiar with each other's story. It's like you've seen their map. If they were like a, I don't know, if they were a piece of geography. I don't know, that was a weird way to explain it. Okay, the second part. In successful marriage is not this idea of nurturing fondness and admiration, that it's like, okay, we know there's a tendency to sometimes be negative about stuff. And so it's important to not do that to the people that you're around the most. And, you know, I need to learn this as much as anybody else. But since we know that, it's almost like leaning a little bit into the over positive. And what this means is like not living in a delusion, but putting a positive spin. I actually put in my note here of what I wanted to read to you. I actually put this all in capitals. So I must have been really thinking this. So I put, remember, positive spin is very different than accepted delusion. So what do I mean by that? That like me saying like, okay, well, my wife's like, I'm basically trying to say that I understand her life's like she's doing her best and like I can like interpret it a certain behavior in different ways right and like it's like the more i choose to lean into the more positive interpretation the 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 easier it is on everybody it's like if we can all give each other a bit of the benefit of the doubt is sort of the idea and that doesn't mean that we're like ignoring red flags or whatever especially if you're like dating someone and you're like it doesn't mean be turn a blind eye to things you should be paying attention to but it means in situations that are neutral lean towards the support of positive the nurturing the fondness in successful marriages partners sign sing each other's praises and more than 90 percent of the time when a couple puts a positive spin on their marriage history when they tell their marriages if it's positive that marriage is likely to have a positive future how'd you, how'd you like that arm shift for dramaticness but basically that idea right think about that it's like Say I'm telling you about my marriage with my wife and it's like if my story is positive, that's actually an interesting predictor of like how the future is going to be. Or if it's all just a complaint and I don't mean a, like a complainy kind of dad joke. I mean like this is an important idea. How you think of the past of it affects how the future goes and, and, and at a certain point that's obvious but it's a good thing to think on. Um, the third point in good marriages, so turning towards in good marriages, is, again, this is like not trying to be all judgy. What it's saying is like, again, we're looking at this as researchers. Let's compare unsuccessful to successful and see what the difference is. And in ones that are successful, we see that spouses are better at turning towards each other regularly. They see each other as friends. This friendship doesn't keep arguments from occurring, but it can prevent the differences from overwhelming. Right. So it's like the idea is that uh, from overwhelming the relationship in these good marriages, spouses respect each other and appreciate each other's point of view. Number four, and this sounds like a weird one, letting your partner influence you and says par uh, the more partners. Pause that. I got the scroll going a bit fast. The more open partners are to each other's ideas and choices, the more likely they are to expect respect and learn from each other. And this is kind of the idea, right, that like. The idea of letting your partner shape you only sort of makes sense as a healthy idea if it's like a healthy relationship, right? And ideally, like you're with someone that loves you and wants the best of you and you're molding each other 
you're kind of helping molding each other. It's maybe too intense of saying it, but you're like, you're influencing each other. Of course you are. Of course my wife's influenced me, right? And of course I've influenced her. And it's like, that doesn't mean she controls me or I control her. It, it's, well, no one influences you more obviously than the people you live with, right? The more direct the, the connection is. The more open partners are to each other's ideas and choices, the more likely they are to respect and learn from each other. This in turn increases chances that they'll have to achieve a cohesive union based on their differences as well as their similarities. And then the last one, creating shared meanings. The more that you can be open and honest and respectful, the more likely they are to be able to create shared meanings in their marriage, right? Like, just had to quick, take a quick check at the monitor. I've had the baby sleeping upstairs. This also includes sharing goals with the spouse, working together to achieve your goals. It's like having a... Around my house, I like, like sports metaphors, right? It's like having a game plan, a shared game plan. And so again, it's like this could be... And I like this picture of just this like older couple like enjoying a reflection... And then and yeah, it's just the I'm trying to think of how to say this point of like, and I just realized looking at that picture that that could be someone in their mom or a relationship, but let's just assume for the point of this discussion, it's a couple, and then. The idea is that relationships that are successful exist in all kinds of different ways, but tend to have as core elements this idea of establishing love mats, maps, uh, nurturing fondness and admiration, turning towards each other like this list here of influencing your partner, creating shared meanings. If we were going to like say, like, what are some significant behavioral, emotional pattern style differences between marriages that tend to work and ones that don't, this would be this is, would be what Gottman's answer would be to you. Okay, I'm just going to read this. In a provocative book titled Marriage, A History, How Love Conquered Marriage, Stephanie Kuntz concluded that marriage in North America today's marriages are fragile, not because we've become self-centered and career-minded, but because our expectations for marriage have become unrealistically high compared to previous generations. To make a marriage work, Kuntz, like Gottman, emphasizes that partners need to develop a deep friendship show respect for each other and embrace commitment and see like this is kind of an in, this is an interesting book by the way especially if you're interested in marriage from almost like a psychology but also almost like a sociology like what role does it play in society and what's the relationship between marriage and love and what's the difference between like um uh what i was kind of talking about on the previous slides of like well, how is marriage different than just being in a long-term relationship? And how's that different than cohabitating? And how's that different in this scenario and this scenario? And this book kind of deals with a lot of those. And she's a really gifted writer. But uh, I wanted to kind of emphasize this main point, right? Development of friendship, respect. And it's like that's... <laughs> I don't know if I should even say stuff like this, but like the literature is super clear, especially the, the literature on male psychology. It's like... Males act completely different when they feel respected. And that's true in relationships. That's true both ways. It's like Gottman. I'm going to try to see if I can put this video in. About Gottman's piece of advice. Maybe I'm going to try to get it in here. Okay, I'll see if I can do it. Okay. Now... Just continuing on this idea, right? <clears throat> and that, I thought that that little clip from Gottman, it kind of said an interesting point, right? It's like, okay, give me 30 seconds. Hopefully that video works. But, and hopefully they're cool about it and this video can stay up without having to get at that edited out. But I set it up so it'd be easy to do that. The um, point is showing that though is to like, What are her dreams? Right? That once you start actively 
future making with the other person it's like well then you start getting at like core values and that shared dream has like almost a relationship protective value to a certain extent it's important wisdom to know personality characters like again this is like a tough sentence like right after what i've already been talking about right with neuroticism it's like again everyone everyone cringes at that word but it just means the tendency to like respond with negative emotion and it's something we all need to work out and, and get better at because it can be a relationship obstacle right um yeah and it's not i'm not like linking it to divorce i'm linking high levels of neuroticism to dissatisfaction right and it's like well and that's like a good good even if not a wake-up call maybe a warning that like be careful being too negative because it's like not just it can trick you into thinking that your situation and your relationship is worse than it is and you can miss or misattributing things like stress from other places as relationship related it's like this is one of the reasons why this would be another argument for it seems weird that in like today's day and age i feel like almost nervous talking about the value of marriage like it's almost countercultural. i don't care whatever attitudes towards divorce like this idea that um how people so this is interesting right it's like okay well if you ask couples when they get married how and they they i think the textbook actually talks about studies where they do this but um if you ask couples how they view divorce like do they view it as like an absolute last resort like maybe if there's like abuse or infidelity or whatever but like they will try to work out things almost no matter what like an oath if it's if it's not those things basically and it's like or are people viewing it as you know a commitment but if things don't work out the exit's right there it's like how close is the exit door and what's interesting is chill for a sec my cat's just like licking his paw like super intense um hopefully that's not picking up on the mic but the more comfortable people are with the idea of divorce the more they report being unsatisfied with their marriage and that's an interesting insight because it suggests that the more there's a plan b somewhere in your head the less satisfied you'll be with plan a and that's not that's a human condition and that's a insight that if you applied it as wisdom would be like well it's the ultimate grass is greener on the other side it's like be the best thing the more you're thinking of like potential other people or whatever that obviously affects stability of the current one right so yeah couples unopposed to divorce report if so again i want to try to make that connection for you that's like if you see it as something that might happen then you judge the current thing differently is my point so i know what you're all thinking mike what is love <laughs> well, that's supposed to be funny here um and it's like okay well let's actually try to talk about this as psychologists it's actually kind of interesting it's like what does what does it mean and and you know it says here like it refers to a vast complex territory of human behavior spanning a range from relationships including intimacy friendship romantic love affectionate love consummate love it's like okay but as psychologists if we're gonna look at different relationships and we're gonna somehow evaluate emotional quality and depth and all that stuff it's like what are we seeing is like the the kind of core components to how love relates to close relationships and the first idea to talk about is this idea of intimacy that almost everywhere you would hear this like there's this there's this connection piece right that like there's something about trust being able to share 
um, I say their adolescents have an increased need for intimacy as they engage in the essential task of trying to figure out who they are, right? That it's important to have that identity development and intimacy development are not just developmental stages that land beside each other on Erickson's model, but are so much more deeply intertwined, right? Think, and think of that, how loaded that sentence is. Managing the demands of intimacy, identity, and independence is the central task of adulthood. That's all you have to do. Why are you complaining? You just have to figure out and develop healthy, long-term, strong relationships, figure out who you are and what you're going to do in the world, then start doing it and be an independent person. It's like, that's actually a pretty huge task. I was kind of joking when I'm like, just go do it, right? It's like, obviously that's stressful. It's like, again, this is why this topic of last week that was more around like this emerging adulthood idea, right? And it was looking at some of the physical changes a little bit more and some of the cognitive changes. And now we're looking at a little bit more of like, okay, well, what's the relational and the emotional, the social emotional aspect of it? Okay, so here I want to introduce you to the, the work of Robert Sternberg in his theory of love. And I'm going to give you definitions in a sec, right? And what you can kind of see here is this is like another one of these examples of a psychology model, right? Where a teacher, where a psychologist is trying to basically show you his whole idea in a picture. And then if you could, like, he has a whole book on consummate love, like where, and so like, but this is what a model is, right? So what he's saying is consummate love is actually what he's calling the combination of these three things. And I'm going to give a breakdown of it in just a sec. Um, let me pet my cat so he stops licking his paw for a half a second. So he's saying consummate love is when there's when the relationship has intimacy, has passion, and has commitment. And he says that people exist, that people have all kinds of other relationships, right? He calls, like, for example, romantic love might be when the intimacy is there and the passion is there, right? And he calls passion both, like, the, the sexual desire, obviously, but then also the longing for the person. And then the intimacy, that has a longing component, too. But, like, the enjoying the closeness but notice how that's missing the intimacy part or the commitment part and then you look at like say something like uh, fascist love or like fake love where it's like the commitment and the passions there but there's no actual intimacy right so that's maybe just a, a relationship where they're committed to each other the the sexual attractions there and the passions there but there's not the not the emotional connection Right. And so you see how other ones are and then companion love when there's maybe the intimacy and the commitment and not the passion. And so remember, it's like it's not like relationships are perfect. He, said, he would say this is like a model you would use in family or marriage counseling. Right. That like say somebody's coming in and it's like you've been married a long time and it's like your marriage is maybe slipping a little bit too much into companion love. And especially if there's kids and it's like that makes sense. And so maybe once you can identify it, that helps knowing where to aim interventions and it's like that's what it is it's okay well what we see when we look at successful couples is ones that are able to sort of balance this triad or his triactic theory of love which just means fancy way of saying three-part triangle or three-part just three-part um three arc and so so yeah so let me give you some definitions here Okay, so Sternberg's saying this idea of how emotional affection contributes to relationship quality. And it's like at a, at a certain point, this is like there's an element of obviousness, right? But it's like we're trying to kind of um, dig deeper here. It's like if I was to say to you, like, do you think my relationship's good? I'm like, I have no intimacy with my partner. There's zero passion and we're not at all committed. I think most of you would be like, ah, that sounds like there's some some things you might want to give second thought to. Another ill-timed coffee sip, sorry. Okay, so Sternberg says that love has three key components. Number one, what he calls intimacy, this feeling that promotes like closeness, connectedness. Right, and I hope this helps kind of when I kind of try to help, but I don't know. 
tell a bit of stories or like Sternberg's an interesting person. He was like really fascinated with this idea of how do we create quality relationships? And he viewed that as actually a core piece of mental health. So then passion, the idea of the intense longing for the union, including like sexual desire and then commitment and this, this variable of like how you envision your future and whether it's with this person and that that's actually a really significant and in some ways almost the most significant variable in terms of longevity of relationships. So she so had words for like the different um, levels, right? And consummate sort of means like all together. And I don't know why as I put up the points, the picture goes away, but it's just supposed to be a picture of like an older couple in a happy long-term relationship. And it's like, that's sort of what this compass consummate idea is right that like it's that combination so it's when you have all three elements there's the passion the physical sexual attraction there's the intimacy the warmth the, the closeness the sharing and the commitment right so if say for example not you know wink 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 it's like say if on the, the test you were asked you could easily see how Sternberg's idea could be turned into multiple choice questions, right? Like, is it which, what's this an example of? And then you'll see that, like, to understand which is which, you'll need to know, like, okay, does this have which, which is missing and which is there, right? Like, if all three are there, it's what's called consummate love. There's the passion, there's the intimacy, there's the commitment. We'll go over the other ones now, too. I added this picture that I just found online of like, um, of, of this concept of this tract theory of love concept. And that, that image is actually pretty good because it, it just sort of shows you, right? Like this would be like your, the table you would draw. It's like, okay, well, if these two are there, we call it infatuation. If these ones are here at a certain level, this is a diagnostic tool, right? It's saying like, okay, infatuation is where there's passion, but not a lot of intimacy or commitment. Affectionate love is when there's intimacy and commitment, but not passion. And then fascist love, when there's fascist love, is when there's passion and commitment, but but not intimacy. And so again, the idea would be like, so say if I said, if I gave you an example, and I said that um, there's a you know person a and person b and there's a lot of passion they're really like a, this is i'm gonna make a terrible question freestyle but there's like attraction between them there's a lot of sexual chemistry they're not dating anyone else um and they've been kind of being just solo dating each other for a long period of time so i'm trying to say like passion and commitment but then but they struggle to talk and there's no like depth to the relationship right then i'd say like which kind is that the question would be phrased better than that ramble, but I think you get the point, right? It's one of these like, and not saying it's just a checklist, but it's saying that usually when couples have trouble, it's in one of these three areas. In case anyone out there is waiting for a quick cat cam, the cat is now sleeping and totally calm and not disturbing the presentation. I just woke him up a little bit. But, uh, oh, huge cat stretch. Oh, oh boy. Back down. Just as families evolve, so do the interpersonal relationships at the heart of family life. Um, so I say your common challenges faced by single adults, forming intimate relationships with others, confronting loneliness. Um, Finding a niche in society. So what's that mean? Like finding your role in the world. And you know, it's like your society still, whether marriage is less common or whatever, it's like any of you that are getting into your mid twenties or thirties and you're single, it's like at the very least you're, you've either thought about it or you're like hearing questions from family. And it's like, that's what I sort of mean about this idea of like, the society being sort of marriage oriented um and then cohabitation is obviously like a huge thing right like living with people before marriage and again it's like well can if someone was to ask like could you live with someone 
and have a relationship of the same quality as a marriage without being married. Take the religious piece aside. And it's like, well, again, it would really come down to that passion, intimacy, commitment piece with commitment being huge and commitment meaning like, that's the thing that's like complicated because it's like commitment means way more than just like not cheating on the person, right? Commitment, although it does also very much mean that, but then it also means like when I picture my future, does it have the person in it? And when they picture their future, does it have me in it? And that that's actually a dimension of our relationship quality is how much we're in each other's future plans, right? It's like, because that's sort of like just a stand in for commitment, right? It's like saying, well, if I'm committed to you, I'm like thinking of my future with you in it. And my point is that the more that's close to a marriage, the more that, well, I guess my point is really that's a successful characteristic of both a marriage and a non-marriage relationship. How is that for a rambly way to say it? Okay, next slide. All right, so like earlier in the course, this is like, again, with a course like this, every topic has potential ability to upset or whatever because like all these things are talking about some of the most intimate aspects of life and I think sometimes addressing these things head-on is the only way to talk about it it's like okay well if you're gonna be in a serious relationship with someone long term and it's more than just dating or whatever casual and it's something that you think is gonna be long term and sustaining it's like how you argue is super important. This is, I was going to, I don't know if I should, I was going to be like, oh, this is my old man mainland advice. But it's like, if I could give you as someone that, you know, I may never actually even meet you in person. But like, if I could give you a piece of advice, it'd be like, keep arguing in your relationships. It's like the, the quickest sign of things going bad is when both sides are too much on eggshells to even talk about the things, right? It's like, and that happens. That obviously does happen even in good relationships. And so it's like, that's where things like humor and stuff like that are so valued. The ability to like talk about awkward stuff sometimes. And sometimes like laugh at stuff, you know? And it's like, my point is that basically all couples are gonna have conflict. And what really distinguishes successful from non-successful, and remember this is like, to say this just for the billionth time, I guess, is that I've told you guys a billion times, I never exaggerate. Sorry, I couldn't resist saying that dad joke. Um, yeah, I'm already pretty deep in the slide. I don't think I'm going to restart it. <laughs> just to edit out my dumb joke. Couples fight. It's how mature relationships are. It's like one example I sometimes reference. I don't know if I have to your group yet, but... It's like my wife, my wife, <laughs> it's great. It's like one of the secrets to uh, a marriage is <laughs> you won't find in the textbook. It's two TVs, but like my, also oftentimes be watching uh, basketball or hockey down here and my wife will be watching usually either Gilmore Girls or Friends on repeat and did you see my girlfriend? I obviously met my wife. Uh, my ex-girlfriend. I used to joke when we got married that she was my ex-girlfriend. Now she's my wife. She never liked that. She wouldn't like me saying it in my lecture. But again, now I'm almost three minutes in, so I'm definitely not restarting. Different um, couples have different relationship patterns, right? And it's like your ability to... Learn how to, this sounds so much like I'm saying it like a lawyer, but learn how to present your case with like keeping the respect of the other person held up. It's like, that's almost the trick. It's not really even a trick. It's like the most basic thing about human relationship at a certain level. It's like people respond better in environments where they, where they feel respected and understood. And that's the most true in the most intimate relationships. 
Uh, okay. So, Mike, how about it's four minutes in? How about talking about something that's on the side? So, these different types of couples, right? Like the first one, validating couples. So, if I was to make some point, say I was like to meet you all in person, and I'm doing like a talk, and I'm making some point about something, and a couple of you're like you're like nodding along. It's like that's validating. You're like giving me positive feedback, and it's like. One thing that you'll notice with couples that are more successful is they tend to build off each other. It's like my wife's like, oh, look at that outside. And I look outside and I say something about that. And she builds off this. It's not like everything's not a non sequitur. It's like. Sometimes if you're in like an argument with your partner and no one's saying anything and then they say something like, hey, what about this? It's like and we like snap at that because we're like, why would you bring that up? And it's like, well. Maybe that's them like extending an olive branch, like trying to get make things a little bit better. And so the more that you can have your disagreements, but without the huge escalation and with some mutual respect and ability to, again, feel respected and feel heard, the listen to part. And then the other idea is that like, so some couples are like based, that'd be basically like the best case scenario that you actually like. And couple, here's an interesting point, couples tend to become more, validating the longer they're together and that sort of makes sense like even me and my wife now it's like we still argue about stuff sometimes but we oh man i don't want to like either make it sound negative or make me sound like i'm trying to sound better than i am because we obviously have fights but it's like i do think if i was evaluating our my marriage as my wife's upstairs not knowing at all what i'm talking about but I would say we, we've gotten better at not having to go down the same dumb paths that we know that neither of us want to go down for the benefit of each other. And that's actually almost like a major maturing relationship step, if that makes sense. It's like I could bring up that thing, but I'm not bringing up that thing. And you could bring up that thing, and you're not bringing up that thing. And we're both kind of trying to hold each other. And we're not on eggshells. It's almost the opposite. It's like almost like a respected honesty, a respect-based honesty. And then there's volatile couples, which would be like the idea of volatile. That's like almost like a chemistry word. Like there's some chemical in a thing, and you put some other chemical in it, and it like blows up. You'd say that was a very volatile, explosive situation. And these couples, there's maybe like... You can think of like maybe a friends like this where they're like always arguing, but then they're also like passionate and they're always joking. And it's like what you find is that some couples, even if they argue a lot, if there's a lot of humor or a lot of other positive stuff, it can kind of counterbalance. Right. Where where you see more of an issue and where it's more linked to the relationship falling down is the minimizing. Right. And this is where I'm saying, like, have the fight. The most weird sounding relationship advice is have the argument. But the better you get at having the argument, the better. But avoiding the argument is is associated with the worst outcomes. It's devitalizing for the relationship. It sucks the energy and the spirit from it. The like literally the what gives it life what gives you life are your vital signs it's devitalizing right that is decent i kind of thought i kind of lost my point there but that pulled it together somewhat decent okay next slide i hope also that i can have a bit of fun with you students like obviously these are deep topics but like and obviously sometimes i make dumb jokes and stuff and a lot of my jokes are just about I don't know, making fun of myself or just like they're not like that's not like I'm actually like trying jokes on you but I don't know I can't be I'm not like it's not my personality to just be Joe serious all the time so I think sometimes it's easier to talk about difficult things if it's sort of the whole point I'm making it's like if you can maintain the respect and you can maintain the sensitivity and you can be vulnerable without being overly vulnerable i guess and just like try to be authentic and genuine and then some people are going to hear you and some people are going to not like you anyways and who cares about them honestly life's too way too short okay so i don't know why i said that divorce 
this topic of oh man what a segue um most common in scenarios where either there's a lot of hostility and no ability to get away right and you got to think like this was must that must have been like just amplified so much by things like covid um or scenarios where it's hostile and then detached right so like a lot of fighting and then a lot of like stonewalling like not not looking at each other and stuff like that um i say their divorce is associated with all kinds of negative uh social and relational and performance related outcomes more lost days at work more things like car accidents more things like depression and and even suicidal ideation divorced adults have higher rates of depression anxiety physical illness suicide motor vehicle accidents alcoholism and mortality issues divorced women and divorced men complain more of loneliness report diminished self-esteem more anxiety about the unknowns in life more difficulty forming satisfactory new intimate relationships um both divorced men and divorced women are more likely to die by suicide than their married counterparts remarry adults remarried adults often find it difficult to stay remarried <clears throat> so a major part of that divorce statistic before is not a huge percentage I shouldn't have said it like that but a part a piece of the pie is this 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 kind of thing that i never hear talked about that much the tendency to divorce like a of a second marriage not working basically is what i'm stumbling over saying remarried adults often find it difficult to stay remarried um so again it's like and this is earlier in the course we looked at this more from like the kids perspective this is that's like a little bit more from here we're looking a little bit more from uh like the individual's perspective okay it's like why learn about it well again it's like look at that top two points that's like the most important piece i'm trying to teach here it's how you do it there's definitely going to be issues oh yeah i started to say this and then i didn't say it um i got lost talking about my wife and i was going to talk about the example from friends so there's this one scene in friends where monica and chandler are dating and they have a fight and chandler's like all upset and stuff because he thought they broke up and then they like see each other later that day and monica's like no like we're still together we had a fight like welcome to an adult relationship i remember her using that line like welcome to an adult relationship it's like we don't have to break up just because we argued about something it's like depending on obviously what the thing was but it's like hey if you date a person and you're serious with them and you're living your life and doing complicated like there's going to be times when you don't agree on everything unless one of you is like super agreeable um i guess there could be that scenario if it's like a perfect match that way but is that a perfect match like who knows right okay how's that for a rambling end let's keep going okay there's just a few last topics i want to touch on and one is is this topic of um ppd or postpartum depression and there's two variations there's psychosis based and non-psychosis and i'm going to explain what that means um This is going to sound like a dumb thing to say but pregnancy is so intense there's so much happening biologically obviously but there's also so much happening psychologically and biochemically and it it 
it can st tornado storm through the body and it can make women that have just had a baby think weird things and feel weird emotions and by a weird emotion it's like you if you, if any most of you've heard of postpartum depression but if you haven't and you're wondering what i mean by a weird emotion like a weird emotion would be like being excited about your baby for months and months and months and then the baby comes and feeling a lack of connection a lack of love and feeling incredible upset about that right and, and people didn't used to understand it and they used to call it the baby blues or whatever and now i'll tell you though like now um and i can just rep say this from like when my first when both my daughters were born uh they have like pamphlets that they basically gave me as a dad saying like watch out for this and this and this and it's much more talked about now which is good and there's some stuff i'm going to show you here and i want to read something to you too okay i just have uh, a few points here i want to make and then i want to read something from the center of addiction and mental health website right so I, this is a period of postpartum depression is affecting something like 10 out of or uh 10 to 25 percent of new mothers right and that's a pretty big gap but that's just kind of um just reflecting the fact that different studies are finding different numbers and it depends on who you're testing obviously the sample group matters but let's just take either of those numbers let's just say 25 percent. so that's like one out of four even if it's one out of ten that's that's a lot of that's super significant statistically even the lower number one out of ten is super significant obviously 25 percent or one out of four is super significant too more, way more so and it's like okay well what causes it well or what is it it's this at the most base level it's this feeling of i, I say the profound sadness that lasts for days or weeks or months or you wouldn't really say that postpartum lasts years but what you could say is that postpartum depression sort of can if untreated and if if it stays intense it can sort of i guess i don't know how to correctly try to clinically say this but maybe almost like transition into a more generalized depressive disorder um more likely it's more likely in women who produce a large amount of steroid hormone late in pregnancy so there's definitely biological um potential causation there and then it's but then it's also like seems to be very stress related too which is so if like the hormone part is on the nature side it's like the stress stuff is on the nurture side and it's saying like okay it's more likely in scenarios where either the mom's stressed or the pregnancy is unplanned and you know this is obviously a massive generalization because some unplanned pregnancies are again it would be really interesting to be able to subdivide that group of unplanned pregnancies into ones that were interpreted by the mom as stressful because like for example well some parents they might be trying and then take a break and then they might get pregnant and it's unplanned but it's a very positive thing and sometimes someone could get pregnant and it's unplanned and it can be a negative thing and i think it's very reasonable to assume like which of those two it is affects like that stat right that like because in the second scenario it's more likely to be a stressful situation and maybe it's this stress and this cortisol effect right and then at the and major life events right so it's basically just saying okay well stressed out moms are more likely to have that happen and then being depressed during pregnancy is actually the biggest predictor right so if you were to say like what's the number one predictor of postpartum depression it's that the mom was depressed during pregnancy and that sort of makes sense right it's like okay so i just want to read something to quick so there's so postpartum depression is the non psychiatric uh, the non psychotic depression that women can experience shortly after childbirth and if you see the non psychotic what's that mean and it said in okay I'll read this first postpartum psychosis 
refers to the sudden onset of, a, of psychotic symptoms after childbirth. This would be like almost wanting to like hurt the baby. And, and, and some moms report this and it's so upsetting. And it's so upsetting and to them. And it's like they're they're having these like weird thoughts towards the baby and it's and that's actually called postpartum psychosis and notice the word psychosis is such a heavy word and it means this like break between you and reality refers to a sudden onset psychosis psychotic symptoms after childbirth this condition is rare approximately one to two cases per a thousand so that's rare but Treatment recommendations are similar to other forms of psychosis. Right, so it's like some mums, that's the case. But the mums that that's the case is like, that's not even 1%, that's 1 per 1,000. Right, and this is saying like 20, up to 25 per 100 per percent, right, per 100. Um, okay. So postpartum depression is different from baby blues, which begins uh, within which begins within the first three or four days of after giving birth. Um, Post-traumatic stress is a deeper depression that lasts a lot longer. It usually starts within the first month after childbirth, or it can although it can start later, and can last weeks to months. And in the most serious cases, can develop into a chronic episode of depression. Every woman, and this is just important to know, right? I'm, I'm not going to read this forever, but every woman is different. But these are some of the signs that are common for um, postpartum depression. Depressed mood and depression with anxiety. Um, a loss of interest in things that would normally bring, bring pleasure, including the baby. Major changes in weight or appetite. Major sleep disturbances. And which is a common symptom of depression and difficult to gauge because sleep disturbance for a new mom is super normal, even in the absolute best of cases. Physical feelings of being slowed down or restless or being jumpy or being edgy. Excessive feelings or guilt or worthlessness, which can be exacerbated by not being able to bond with the baby when feelings of extreme joy and love are what are expected. A diminished concentration and inability to think clearly, uh, which can be worsened by sleep deprivation. Recurrent thoughts of I'm not going to test you on this, by the way, so don't don't you don't have to be scrambling writing this. I just want you to know this. Recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. For example, the woman may catch herself thinking that the baby and her are better off dead, or that the world is such an awful place to bring a new child in that we'd be better off out of it. Why would I be telling you these specific things? Because there's warning signs to look for either in yourself or your loved ones. It's a real thing. And it's a chemical disturbance. It's like a, this is why I was trying to, you know, I, I don't have the, the perfect words to say it, but it's related to the complexity of the biology of the pregnancy, right? And how that can sometimes interplay with them, potentially pre-existing depression or the complex emotions associated with it. New mothers often resist acknowledging these signs even to themselves because of the pressure to meet societal expectations of what it means to be a good mother. There's no single cause, uh, there's no single cause of, oh yeah, sorry, I thought, I was saying cause, but I was thinking in my mind case. There's no single cause of depression, uh, and therefore no single cause of PPD. Physical, hormonal, social, psychological, and emotional factors may all play a part in triggering the illness. This is known as a biopsychosocial model of depression, and is what is accepted by most researchers and clinicians. Clinicians. Um, it is important to remember, though, that the sleep deprivation resulting from having a new baby can make women especially vulnerable to factors triggering even general depression. The, the three biggest risk factors. Does the person have a personal history of depression? Did they have depression during a previous pregnancy? And is there depression in the family? Right, so the treatment is generally the same as that as normal depression, psychotherapy, CBT is very helpful, supportive counseling, and sometimes even things like antidepressants or hormonal therapy, um, light therapy. Interesting that those that bright light therapy is on there. 
Okay. So anyways, I hope that wasn't brutal. Oh man, that slide's nine minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done the presentation. It's going to be about an hour and a half total. All right, a couple last points to make and then we'll hit our uh, lightning round quiz review. Um, sensation seeking, risking behavior tends to decline once you have kids. I remember like when uh, Evelyn was born, my first. I have a couple funny stories. If I, I'll give you a second to write this down. Um, yeah, like when Evelyn. <laughs> one kind of funny thing. It was like. Uh, Yeah, just the classic, like, the, the all the Lamas training or whatever it was called about, like, okay, rub her back and just tell her to stay calm, <laughs> stay calm. Then we're in the car and I'm, like, driving, oh, the most in, intense car ride of my life was driving, because at that time I lived in Cambridge, I live in Kitchener now, and I've almost always lived in Cambridge, except for, like, a short period of time right after we got married. We had a place in Cambridge for a bit, which is just like pretty close to Kitchener if you're not familiar. Um, and so I'm driving from Kitchener to from Cambridge to Kitchener to the hospital, and the midwife's behind us. When we get there, the midwife's like, "Your your speeds really fluctuated. Like sometimes." you were going almost normal and then other times you were like racing and it was like yeah because at like certain times my wife was like screaming at me to hurry up so that's probably what i was going faster but i was like I, the one funny part is she's like having a bad contraction i'm like in my head i'm like do it you're trained i'm like it's okay relax and she just screams at me not now sorry i just scared the cat not now, and I'm like, wah! <laughs> just totally not ready to get screamed at. Who okay, cares? Eyes on the road. Um, yeah, that was intense. But then I remember, like, on the drive home, being like, I can't believe how bumpy all these roads are. Right, all of a sudden, I got this little baby in the back seat, and it's like, all of a sudden, I'm like paranoid of everything. I'm like, holy, come on, buddy slow down it's like everything's too fast too aggressive the tv's too mean and everything is like that's something i say to students sometimes i'm like a, the most like pro uh pro free speech in a lot of ways especially around things like politics and around the idea that i think like my grandpa's fought in world war ii so they me and you are allowed to think and believe what we want. But at the same time, once you have, not at the same time, I believe that. I also believe in age appropriateness and that like, as soon as you have a kid, you start to become so sensitive to stuff. It's like, all of a sudden you realize like, whoa, it's like, just like the background screen when you turn on Netflix and it's like some like violent thing or scary thing or sexualized thing. And you're like, man, does it have to be everywhere? It's like, and it's like stuff you don't even notice until you have a two-year-old that is like, what's this? What's this? What's this? Right? And so I'm just trying to give, uh, I don't know, and uh, my own reflection on what, what less risky behavior really means. It's like all of a sudden you got this second pair of eyes that's asking you to interpret what they're seeing and you're like... And that's an aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is you want to be there for that person. And so I'm less now me getting hurt affects my earning potential. It affects my ability to support these people. And these people are the most important thing. And it's like, it would make sense that if you're thinking thoughts like that, your risk taking would go down. Marital satisfaction tends to decline and remain low until the child leaves the home. Oh. <sighs> I have a two-year-old, so that's, <laughs> well, life will get better again in about 20 years. No, but I'm just joking. It's, children are the hardest task, in a way. 
like it's every day. It's whether you're in a good mood or not. It's also the absolute best thing there is. You know, I'm obviously biased. Um, I just got my seven-year-old to sleep. We were learning about emperor penguins. You know, my two-year-old, I got to sleep tonight singing her. her I sing the song that never ends. Do you remember that? Do any, are any of you old enough to have seen Lamb Chops play along? <laughs> it's Even if you just Google it, the song that never ends, I'll just sing it to you quick. I sing this to my kids constantly. Because it's rhythmic and boring and it makes them fall asleep. You go, this is the song that never ends. You can see how good of a singer I am. It just goes on and on, my friend. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was. And they'll continue singing it forever just because this is the song that doesn't end. And it just starts into the song again, right? And it's like, my daughter will be like, oh, this is dumb. My older daughter will be like, this is dumb, this is dumb. And by like the fifth time, she's asleep. Again, the boringness is what makes them fall asleep. A super fascinating story is not going to make them fall asleep. And it's probably time to finish this slide if I just sang to you Lamb Chops play along. Marital satisfaction. Oh, yeah. Okay, so division of labor. Like, what a way to even think about it. Like, even think of that, that language, right? It's like, that's like workplace language. Whose job's what? It's like before I had kids, it was like, oh, where would you like to go for dinner tonight? What do you want to do tonight? You want to you want to go to the park? Do you want to like go to a movie? Is there a local singer in town? Singer in town? Is there a, a local show at the tavern? But it's like we were, we would do stuff. It's not that we don't do stuff now, but now we, it's it's like. Well, there's a tobogganing day. There's like the barbecue, and I love that stuff. It's honestly, I've I've learned to find like I don't know. I think you see what I'm saying. But division of labor just labor just means well, who's changing the diaper at four in the morning, and then what about again at six in the morning, and then what about when the other kid's sick and or wet the bed or something? And it's like. Because it's not, it's not division of labor around who gets, like, the cute hug before bed. It's about all the stuff no one wants to do. And it's about the regular style chores, like cleaning the fridge and, like, emptying the green bin and all, like, the little things, right? And this is where, like, that second point, support from extended family. Like, the reason I have that, one of the things, one of the stories I would tell about this, and I know I'm getting super storytelling on this. This is the last story of the day. It's like I remember when my daughter was just born and then it was like day one, day two. And then on day three, my mom, maybe it was day two. Because the night before she was born, she was born at five in the morning. So like we didn't sleep. And then the whole next day didn't really. And then it was the next day. My mom came both days. But that second day, she stayed overnight and slept in the room with the baby and me and Julie slept in the other room. My wife slept in the other room and actually slept. And I remember the next day being like, I remember before that being like totally feeling totally overwhelmed. Right. Like I'm saying like my first day or two as a dad and totally sleep deprived and then having like a decent sleep and being like, okay, we can do this. And I'm saying like the role of even just my mom being able to come and help us have a good sleep is one of the things that like is an unspoken or not an unspoken, but sometimes maybe underappreciated protective factor for the relationship, for the family and just for all of that. Um, and then it's, yeah, it affects life satisfaction even more if you're a single parent because in all those things I just said, there's no division of lab labor in that scenario, right? There's, it's, if it's just you, then it's, again, here's the interesting thing. Life satisfaction
it's this age old pl- again it's like oh man i'm 10 minutes in what's going on here um time is this time is flying you're probably thinking this time is creeping and i'm sorry but it's like what's happiness if like so what i want to just be happy every day i want to just like what drink drinks on the beach again the 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 old philosopher idea that is still so true it's like that's awesome for a day okay for it's like a vacation if it's like a week or two it's like if it's a month if it's a year if you're 40 doing that for months in a row it's like all of a sudden it becomes a pretty sad story it's like again (laughs) i might be having a hard time selling you on the idea of like being beach life being rough that's not even what i mean all i mean is like a life where you're just pursuing happiness it's like if, if the reason you didn't have kids was because you thought it would let you go out less with your friends it's like okay then i guess but but the weight on the other side is or is it the opportunity to have maybe the closest relationship you'd ever have in your life may as well end today's lecture with the depressing graph so this is looking at marital satisfaction through the family life cycle right and looking at again this is like a loaded question this is a hardcore loaded question to ask a married person like how much percentage of like okay how many couples report that things between them are going well all the time it's like even if i said that to all my married friends that are in good relationships like are things between you and your wife good all the time the amount of again it's like maybe when you're older and one of the reasons for that is because of the less like like right now i'll give you the just the this will be my last rant it's like my daughter's school's basement flooded so it's been actually closed this whole week plus my younger daughter's like a bit sick so it's been like just like all this like trying to sort out even just childcare. And so that's just like one thing right and it's like that's just a thing that now is like an extra stress that like me and my wife have to like either work together on or maybe even argue about or whatever right and it's like when school and there's a reason why the school age is the lowest dip right and then as the kids are starting to get older and some of that day-to-day um kind of like almost parent parent chores like even just like things like my morning every day is getting up at and again this is like just (laughs) you're my therapist i guess today this is like me just saying so much stuff but every day i'm up at like 6 45 basically get up feed the cat change charlotte's diaper and get her clothes on and then put her in her baby seat and she has cereal and then eventually i'll go up and and i'll start the coffee and then eventually i'll go up and get evie and get her down and get her dressed and then eventually my wife will come down and take them like during this whole time my wife eventually like during there somewhere she's getting up getting ready and then she takes the kids to one to school and one to daycare and so again like that whole morning routine is so different than if like before we had kids and it was like we would wake up an hour and a half later than that or whatever and then each have a shower and and then get dressed and go it's just different it's just totally different yeah so i only have like 20 years that i can be happy again but again i'm just, just trying to make a joke to you hope you're doing okay and uh I don't know one of the things is like without sounding super corny is I appreciate the opportunity I have to you know say a few words to the next generation of teachers and you're a good group of people and keep your stick on the ice let's do this lightning round okay so I have some I think I already told you this. I said this already. Yeah, that I had some students that didn't in Kitchener that didn't know what I meant by keep my keep the stick on the ice. 
I feel like I, I'm feeling deja vu like I already told you that. They're like, why do you keep saying put your stick on the ice? It's like, oh, when I was growing up, that's what my dad always would say. Keep your stick on the ice. It just means stay ready. You don't know. You know, your your life might get significantly better very soon in unexpected ways. Keep, uh, you know, it's like... It's when you have to be ready for those opportunities. Anyways, take care. Cheers. You're great people. And uh, sorry, this went a bit long. See you on the next presentation. Welcome to the world famous lightning round. Lightning round. Lightning round. The first 20 years are important in predicting. <laughs> that was so lame. In predicting an adult's personality, but are in but so are ongoing experiences, right? So basically like early life, but also all of life. Attachment styles, for example, reflect childhood patterns and continue to influence relationships in adulthood. Adult attachments are categorized as secure, avoidant, or anxious. A secure attachment style is linked with positive aspects of relationships. Costa and McRae, so this is like the, the most kind of classic version of the big five, includes... Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, sometimes nowadays referred to emotional stability or lack thereof instability. Erickson theorized that intimacy versus isolation is a key developmental issue in early adulthood. Right, This is kind of just a point I'm kind of continuing from, from last week. Number four. Friendship plays an important role in adult development, especially in terms of emotional support. Romantic love, also called passionate love, includes passion, sexuality, mystery of emotions, all of, not all of which are positive. Affectionate love, also com called companionate love, usually becomes more important as relationships mature. Right, and at number five, you might want to add your notes. This is a Gottman idea, and I don't know if I even really super highlighted this concept of like how as people are together for longer and longer, what becomes super important in maintaining depth and quality is is the emotional connection, the companionship piece. And and while the first part is important too, it's it's like if you ask people that are like later in life what's most important in their marriage they'll often say things like loyalty dependability friendship familiarity these things is like what would make you want to be with someone long term like that and then number six sternberg has this triactic model right passion intimacy and commitment if all three of these qualities are present the result is what he called consummate or or complete all the pieces are there is what the word consummate would mean last point the last thing uh so we talked about gottman right and this idea of the love maps the idea of nurturing fondness and admiration turning towards each other accepting the influence of the partner creating shared meanings and this idea of like learning from the tendencies associated with successful relationships right it's oh sorry have the baby monitor right close by. Uh, Charlotte just almost woke up. She's got a bit of a bit of a cough. You might have just heard that. Um, she looks like she's going back to sleep. Anyways, I just wanted to say um, I know in this presentation I was a bit like rambly, but I think I don't know if if you, this is chapter ten. It's a, it's like you don't know my style by now. Uh, cheers. I appreciate you big time.